Well, good morning, Eastview. How's everyone doing? Good. It's good to be back. My name is Steve Carter, if we've never met. And 2024, man, what a year. University of Michigan wins a national championship. Let's go. Taylor Swift wins a Super Bowl. Let's go. Spring training begins for the Cubs and the Cardinals. Let's go. And Eastview has a new lead pastor. Let's go. Yeah. Now, here's the thing. I, uh, we've been in this series in the book of John, and I got slotted for this weekend, and then they were making the announcement, like the announcement, and I was like, you're gonna make me preach from John? And so I called Tyler, and like, we started like, kind of talking and praying, and he gave me freedom to kind of do something a little bit different. And so this, in my kind of prayer time over this service, I really want this to be a benediction, a blessing, a blessing for Pastor Brandon and his family, but also a blessing over you all. And to do that, I wanna walk through a couple of different storylines from the life of someone that I think is a remarkable leader. Uh, we first meet this man, his name is Joshua in the book of Exodus. If you have a Bible, you can turn with me to Exodus chapter 33. And in Exodus 33, we see something really, really beautiful. This is this in verse 7. Now, Moses used to take a tent and pitch it outside the camp some distance away, calling it the tent of meeting. Anyone inquiring of the Lord would go to the tent of meeting outside the camp. And whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people rose and stood at the entrances to their tents, watching Moses until he entered the tent. As Moses went into the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and stay at the entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses. Whenever the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance to the tent, they all stood and worshiped each at the entrance to their tent. And then verse 11, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Then Moses would return to the camp, but his young aide Joshua, son of Nun, not son of a nun, because that would be weird, but son of Nun, did not leave the tent. This is the first time we meet this man named Joshua. He's a young aide. He is kind of this apprentice of Moses. He follows where Moses goes. When Moses starts making his way to the tent, the whole place stands. In the sense of expectation, God is up to something. And when Moses would leave the, leave the tent, Joshua would stay. Because he saw he saw the way that which God would speak to Moses, and he longed for that. Have you ever had that moment when you saw the way that someone could just worship? Ever feel this moment where you, you actually feel like you're around someone who hears the word of God, and you have this sense of, I want what they have. And this is what Joshua, the beginning, and in the Jewish tradition, the first time you meet someone, where the first time a word is mentioned, it's called the principle of first mention, and it sets the tone for how this person will live or what this word will mean from now on. And for Joshua, it was about God's presence. It was about longing and being expectant for God's presence. And so for the first part of this blessing and benediction message, my prayer for Pastor Brandon and for Eastview Church, may you crave God's presence. May you never stop longing to hear from God. May you never forget that God is here. And if God is here, that means that this moment is brimming with redemptive potential. That the God of all creation wants to connect with you. But that's just the first time we meet Joshua. The next time we meet Joshua, we begin to see a story. Now, the Hebrew nation had been living in slavery. And then they find themselves getting free. They cross the Red Sea, and they begin moving towards this land 
of milk and honey. And back then, that, that symbolized that this land was special. To us, I don't know. For me, it would be a land filled with barbecue and Dr. Pepper. <laughs> that would be the promised land. But milk and honey was a big deal. And back there, they begin to move towards this promised land, but they didn't have smartphones. They didn't have like Wikipedia. They didn't have like drones that they could fly over and go, hey, this is what the promised land looks like. So what does Moses do? Moses calls one man from each of the 12 tribes of Israel and says, I want you to go spy. I want you to go check out the land. And he gives them a whole slew of questions in, in chapter 13 of the book of Numbers. He's like, I want you to know, is the soil fer fertile? Who lives there? Is it, it would tell me, bring back some grapes. What are they like? Tell me what it tastes like. Was God true when he said that this land is so special? And so the 40 years had led up to this moment and the 12 spies go out and they're gone. And the whole nation is like waiting on bated breath going, what's it gonna be? What's this land gonna be like? In the book of Numbers, we see in verse 13, they come back and they're a little scared. Look what it says in verse 31. But the men who had gone up with him said, we can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. And so what happens is these men, 10 of them, 10 of the 12, these 10 men of the 12 begin to spread a bad report saying, this is not a good idea. We should just stay in the desert. We should stay in the wilderness. We, we should stay where we are comfortable, what we know what to expect. We can't go there. And then they have this profound line, verse 33, we saw the Nephilim, which is like a nation field of Shaquille O'Neal's, just massively tall, strong nation. We saw the Nephilim there, the descendants of Anak come from the Nephilim. And look what this line says. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. In the face, we felt so small so insignificant. When we look at us and we look at them, there is no way. And all of a sudden, the reports began to spread throughout the people. And the people who once were filled with such bated breath, is it going to be a land of milk and honey? Is it going to be so special? Now had been overwhelmed with anxiety and fear for the future. But at this moment, as all of the murmurs and grumbling and fear and anxiety was beginning to come to a pitch level, a couple people stood up. Verse six, chapter 14 of Numbers, it says, Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh. And if you never know how to pronounce a word, just say it quickly and with authority and move on. Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had explored the land, they tore their clothes and said to the entire Israelite assembly, the land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and will give it to us only do not rebel against the Lord and do not be afraid of the people of the land because we will devour them. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. All of a sudden, this entire moment, when they have felt like the size of grasshoppers, two guys, Caleb, son of Jephunneh, Joshua, son of Nun, stand up and say, even the grasshoppers will have their day. And it's not because of our strength, but it is because if the Lord is pleased with us, we will devour them. And the whole nation responds in verse 10 by wanting to stone them. Can you imagine just two people in the face of all the anxiety, in the face of all the fear, looking at the circumstances going, there's no way, there's no way, there's no way. And two people stand up because they know who their God is. 
And they understand that the God that was is the God that is and the God that will be. And because of that, they have the courage to look every one of the people in the eye and say, this is our time. It takes guts. It takes grit. It's really easy to go with the flow. I mean, you've heard me say this, that nobody drifts towards holiness. Nobody just wakes up one day and is like, oh my goodness, it's crazy. I'm patient and humble. <laughs> nobody, nobody just has a moment where they find themselves standing and looking in the face of adversity, but see God's opportunity of what he wants to do. But Joshua and Caleb do. And I think Moses looked at that. And he saw of this entire nation, two men who had chutzpah, who had a sense of passion, who had a sense of anchoring in the Lord, but two men who understood what it meant to own the moment. And the second kind of blessing I have for this congregation and for Pastor Brandon is Pastor Brandon and the Eastview Church May you own this moment. Here's the truth. We like to think about what we control. You don't control very much. Let's just be really, really honest. The past already happened, and some of us, we're always living in the past, but there's nothing that we can do to actually change the past. Some of us, like me, often live more in the future, but the future hasn't happened yet. We do not control. There's nothing I can do that can make tomorrow come any sooner. I have no control over the future. So the question is, what do we actually have control over? And it's really, really simple. The only thing that we have control over is this present moment. And how you choose to own this moment will prepare you for the moments to come. But if your focus is constantly on the past, many of us will go into the present and into the future fixated on the past. Or for many of us, like me, who are fixated on the future, if you're constantly looking at the future, looking out there, looking at what tomorrow, looking at what five years will be, looking at what 10 years will be, looking what my, my 401k will be, looking in the future, and all of a sudden, you will miss what is right in front of you. Can you imagine a church who craved God's presence, a church who could hear God's whispers, and a church who was committed to own the moments that God put before them, even when it was difficult, even when it didn't make sense, even when their backs were up against a wall, they could say, but my God. As I was just praying for this message, I had this sense, man, I think that God wants us to be so present here so that we can hear the whispers, we can crave his presence, and we can go where he wants us to go. But that's not the only story of Joshua. Many of you know the story as they come to the promised land. But Moses, Moses has sinned. Because of Moses' sin, he can't enter into the promised land. So Moses has to now go through this succession process and think through, who do I turn over the reins to? And so they begin to kind of think through, and I'm sure that for Moses it was like, two guys, Caleb or Joshua. And Caleb didn't want the job, but Joshua did. And in this moment now, Joshua is now being asked to enter into the next season. And I don't know about you, but I don't know the shooting guard who followed Michael Jordan. I don't know the coach at UCLA who followed Coach John Wooden. And for Jewish thought leaders, the greatest leaders were King David and Moses. And there's this sense where I imagine Joshua going, me? <laughs> I'm not Moses. Like, what we're, 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 I don't have a brother named Aaron. Like, I don't, I don't have, like, someone who's gonna help lift my arms. What? What are you talking, me? 
And in Joshua chapter one, which is one of my favorite passages, God speaks. And hear these words, Joshua one, verse one, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. Like, that's, that's drastic, Lord. Yeah, Moses is dead. Now then, you and all of these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give them to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert of, to Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. No one will be able to stand against you, you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. So this is, this is what God says to Joshua. I'm stepping into this role. I know I'm not Moses. And God says, I'm gonna be with you. But here's what I need you to do. I need you to cross the Jordan River. I don't know if you have any of you have ever seen the Jordan River up close. The Jordan River begins at the highest point in Israel, this mountain. and begins to make its way down straight to the Dead Sea. And at flood stage, it is the fastest flowing river. To cross it, in many ways, would be more difficult than crossing the, sea, the Red Sea. And in this moment, I think Joshua is going, wait, wait, what? You're gonna give me all this land, okay? You're never gonna leave me nor forsake me, awesome. Wait, 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 can you go back to that one moment? You want us to cross the Jordan? Really, God? I don't know if any of you ever had those moments where you hear God whisper and you're like, really, God? You're asking me to do this? And then God does something. God says these words, verse six, many of you know them. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Verse seven, be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go and keep this book of the law. This is the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it, then you will be prosperous and successful. So God says these words, be strong and courageous. And then he says, this book, meditate on it. And I write a sermon, I often ask questions of the text, but when we meditate on the scriptures, we let this book ask questions of our life. God says to Moses, or to Joshua, don't look to the right, to the left. Stay fixated. Proclaim what I ask you to proclaim. Do what I ask you to do. Trust me. My third blessing for Eastview Church and for Pastor Brandon is may you never stop declaring the promises of God. If we are people who crave the presence of God, if we are people who own the moment, if we are people who never stop declaring the promises of God, I am telling you, friends, this season with God and what happens in Normal and Bloomington and the surrounding areas, you are gonna do such incredible things for the Lord. But that's not even the most fascinating part for me. Most fascinating part for me is verse nine. Look what it says in verse nine. Have I not commanded you be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Three times and four verses, God says, be strong and courageous. Be strong and very courageous. Have I not commanded you? Verse nine, do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Be strong and courageous. And did you know that that phrase, be strong and courageous, became the Hebrew battle cry? 
And at every moment when the Hebrew nation would go into battle, they would sing this phrase. And this phrase was simply in Hebrew, be strong and courageous, rock, shazak, rock, shazak. And this is what this nation would do. If you've ever been to a basketball game and you've seen the warm-ups and they're listening to some hype music, rock shazak was the hype music. It was what got the people fired up because it reminded them to be strong, not in themselves, but in the God who was with them, a God who was for them, a God who would never leave them nor forsake them, a God that was here in the present, but a God that was gonna go before them. And all they had to do was crave his presence, own the moment and declare his promises and God was not gonna stop blessing them. 2017. I uh, was invited to the Vatican, and um, the Pope uh, brought a couple of leaders together, and I, I don't know, I didn't know what to do, um, but I said, I'll, I'll go to Rome. Um, but I, I was thinking to myself, um, what, what do you bring the Pope? And I, I, do I bring him a candle? I don't know, do I bring him like a Bible? And I started going through my mind, and um, I thought to myself, you know what I'm gonna bring him? I'm gonna bring him a Cubs jersey. And so, uh, <laughs> this is what I do. And um, I bring him a Cubs jersey, and, and to all you St. Louis fans, stay with me. The Pope is there, and there's a bunch of guys in like red robes. And they walk up to me, and they say, boo, Cubs, go Cardinals, as they point to themselves. <laughs> I was like, this is classic. But I'm holding up this jersey, and I have this whole story in my head because Chris Bryant went to a Jesuit school and the Pope was from a Jesuit order and I was trying to explain it to him. He did not understand what I was talking about. But he said, do you want me to bless your jersey? I said, no, I don't. He goes, I would like to give you a blessing. Okay. I come with this, this jersey to give him and he's like, I have something for you. And I'll never forget this. I recorded it on my phone. And he looks at me and goes, preach. The world needs better preaching. Don't stop preaching Jesus. Don't stop preaching good news. The world needs better preaching. And then he walked away. And I kid you not, I am in like row 33E, terrible seat. It's the middle of the night, I'm flying a red eye back home from Rome. And I'm sitting here going, what just, what just happened? Like I climb over one person, I get my bag and I get my journal, I just start writing that down. And it was just words. But all of a sudden I started to realize, oh my goodness, that the power of this book power to live under the authority of God's word, the power to open up this book and to continue to preach, continue to proclaim God's grace and God's peace and God's goodness and God's fire, continue to preach the name of Jesus. And I kept thinking to myself, when you have a moment like that, sometimes you don't necessarily know how to share it with people. Because I can tell you, I had the chance to meet the Pope and, and, he, and he, he'd said that to me and I can make you listen to the recording, but I have a picture. The picture now gives you a sense of like, oh, he actually did that. And, and you have this moment. But think about Joshua. There's no picture. There's no like, I had this chance with the Lord. I, 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 all he does is he comes out and he, he walks out to the nation and he goes, hey friends, we're crossing the Jordan River. And they're like, who do you think you are? You don't look like Moses. You don't dress like Moses. You don't act like Moses. How do we know that we can actually cross the Jordan River, the fastest flowing river in the world? How can we know, Joshua? And Joshua says, well, the Lord told me three times in four verses, Rakshazak. 
And I imagine the people going, really? That's, that's it. Our man Moses had like a staff. He could like throw it down. It could become a snake. He could pick it back up. Moses could like make miracles. What are you telling us to do? And then he tells them, if you read the book of Joshua, he tells them, I just need some of the priests who would be so willing to hold the Ark of the Covenant, which was the presence of God. And if they would have the courage to trust that God spoke to me, to have the courage to put their feet in the Jordan, God says that the whole river is gonna slow down and that our whole nation will be able to go and cross over into this next season. And anytime you cross the body of river to the Jewish mindset, it meant a chapter was turning. There was a new chapter, a new section, a new story that was to be written. And I imagine these priests start looking at each other. And um, a couple of them say, we'll do it. And so they put their hands, and I'm sure they're going... God, be with Joshua. Please tell me that was true. Please tell me that wasn't bad pizza. Please tell me, please tell me, please tell me. You're doing it? Okay, on the count of three. One, two, three. And they start to walk. And the whole nation starts to walk. And they get to the other side, and God's like, I'm not done, I'm not done. And the first time I ever came to Eastview, I was like walking to see all the different rooms. And all of a sudden I looked out and there was this massive rock. And I was like, oh my goodness, this is amazing. Because I've seen those in Israel. They're called standing stones. And the truth is when you read Joshua 3 and Joshua 4, when they cross over to the other side, God says, I need one person from every tribe to bring a massive standing stone and set it up. And the reason is because someday your children will ask, what happened here? And then a father, a mother, a rabbi, a grandfather, a grandmother will tell them, this is where there were some priests who stood up and trusted that God had spoken to Joshua and we were able to enter into the next season and to the promised land. And here's the most beautiful piece. What do you guys call that? Like witness garden? What is it called? Witness rock? Yeah, witness rock. Did you know, actually, in Hebrew, whenever you saw one of those standing stones, you would say, masavot. It's just such a fun word to say. And it literally meant, what happened here? And the idea was, when you saw a standing stone, masavot. What happened here? The father, the mother, the rabbi, the grandfather, the grandmother, they would tell the story of God's faithfulness. And friends... I think we are on the precipice of the Jordan right now. And every time I've come here, a majority of times I made you do some random things. And this, this might fail and I'll never be invited back. It's okay. <laughs> but as I was praying, did you know that they never believed that black swans existed? They only thought white swans. But how many black swans do you need to see to prove that black swans exist? One, you just need one. And in a world where there's like the sense of a church that craves God's presence, a church that's willing to own the moment, a church that won't stop declaring God's promises, a church that has such trust that God will go before them. And I have the sense we are standing on the shores of a fast flowing reality. And then the, the thought hit me. I wonder if there's some priests in the Eastview congregation. I wonder if there are some priests who believe in their heart and in their gut and in their spirit that God is not done with this place. And I have this sense in my heart that maybe some of them might stand up right now. And they might just stand up and say, I, I believe I believe that God is not done with this place. Is there anyone in this house that believes that?
Oh, you don't even know. Don't, don't sit down. Stay standing. You don't even know what you got yourself into right now. <laughs> because then I started to think, those priests were having to look, and they're going, why, what, what, why? What are we doing? Because Rock Shazak. And then I started to think, man, we got a battle cry. Because we're going to go out, but we got to be the people. And then I started to think, maybe, maybe, maybe we should just have a moment where we scream Rock Shazak. <laughs> I mean, why not, right? The kids get to have all the fun. I wanted to scare them. They're like, what's going on? But I want to do something. I only got a few moments left. I want to do something. Because I want to say a blessing over you, and if you believe that, I want you to pray and scream out as loud as you can. Rock, Shazak. And this is what's going to happen. I will say it first, and then I will point to you. When I point to you, I'd love for you to say it. And if you're watching online, you say it from your living room too. <laughs> so here it is. My brothers and sisters of Eastview Church, may we never stop craving God's presence. Rock Shazak! Rock Shazak! My friends of Eastview Church, may we own this moment. Rock Shazak! Rock Shazak! For every kid that walks into these ministries, may they come to know the grace and peace that is found in Christ alone. Rock Shazak! Rock Shazak! May you, Eastview Church, may we never stop declaring God's promises. Rock Shazak! Rock Shazak! And may there be more baptisms. May heaven get bigger. May there be more boldness in this house. May we never stop serving and loving our neighbor, inviting them into your story, God. And as we enter in, may we never do it in our own strength. May we do this all for you. Rock Shazak! Rock Shazak! And so God, I just pray. You said if we just speak the name of Jesus, people will go to their knees. People could be healed. And God, I pray in this next season, as we begin marching across into this next season, I pray blessing and favor. But I pray that we never, whether we're on this stage or not, whether we're serving or not, whether helping people in need or not, whether we're in the marketplace or not, whether we're in our home or not, may we never stop speaking your name. So give us that strength. Give us that courage. Rock Shazak, we pray all this your name and all God's people said, amen.